Hey, what's going on, everybody? It's Jason Park with the Hypertube Podcast, and I'm here with Steve Moon. The man is a writer, director, producer. He's done o- over 30, 40 projects. This man has been getting it since 2000. Steve, what's up, man? <laughs> oh, you make it sound bigger than it is, but thank you <laughs> for doing that, man. Just, yeah, I've been working, been doing it 25 years, full time since 2008. And um, you, you just work. You, you just work, and you try to build a name for yourself, and that's what you do. So let, let, let's take it back then. Let's take it back to 2008. Let's take it back to 2000. Let's, let's go to 1994. What, what was that moment for you, <laughs> right, where you saw something and you said, I want to do that? Like, what inspired you? All right. It's weird you say 94. Let's go to 93 when I was trying to graduate from college. I am old. I'm 53 years old. I'm also old school. We kind of mentioned that before. But um, I didn't know what I wanted to major in out of high school. I just knew I was creative. I knew I could write. I knew I could do all these things, but I had no idea what to do. My dad was um, uh, worked for a trucking company and my mom was a teacher. So they were like, just, you know, get through college and then, you know, you can find yourself. But I always knew that I wanted to write. So I majored in graphic design. I could do ads. Back in the day, though, we didn't have like the Macintosh computers with all the uh, nice software. We had page makers. So what am I going to do? Lay out newspapers? But again, I was just always a writer. And then every time that we did like graphic design or photographs or anything like that, and we would critique our work in college, everybody always said, oh, this guy wants to be a writer. This guy's a good writer. So I was like, okay, it's going to take me five years to graduate. I still graduated, but I still didn't know what I wanted to do. But uh, country music videos were big in the 90s. So I thought, okay, I want to go do country, country music videos. I had a couple of interviews, but never moved to Nashville. And then I started writing. And long story short, around 95 or 96, I tried to get me some um, oh, what were they? Some agencies out in L.A. So I had nine different agencies looking at my work. And fast forward to 1997, a movie called Firestorm starring Howie Long came out. And I was like, that's that's my movie. That's my movie. All the trailers that I'm watching, that's my movie. Somebody plagiarized me. So I went to go see the movie and talked to everybody. I'm like, that's, that's my script. Uh, although my script was more of a drama and Firestorm was an action movie, uh, a bad action movie, but an action movie. But they even used some of my characters' nicknames. So I got with the Writers Guild of America. They give you three entertainment lawyers back in the day. They gave you three entertainment lawyers pro bono for free. And they said, okay, Moon, who can you? And, and they call me Moon. Um, anyway, uh, they're like, who, who are you going to sue? Which agency did this? Which employee? Which disgruntled employee? Which which janitor took your script out of the garbage can and pitched it himself? So I was like, I get your point. So they're like, you can either move to L.A. and become a writer and wait tables like everybody else, become a waiter, and hopefully get your break. Or you can do independent films and stay where you are in Birmingham, in Alabama. So fast forward two more years. Uh, 1999, I meet with the director of Boys Don't Cry, Kimberly Pierce. I met with her director of photography. And they just gave me some ideas on how to do independent film, how to, you know, work with locals and local actors and people that have gear and equipment and just kind of horse trade your way into directing a film. So I started out as a director in 99, 2000 and made a feature film. It was my first time out. I never started as an intern or a PA. I started out as a writer, director. The movie wasn't any good. But it was my first movie. Our first movies and, never are. Our first yeah, oh, gosh. Man, our kids' <laughs> movies never are. Yeah. Uh, but as God would have it, I'm, I'm very religious when it comes to that, but as God would have it, the liaison of the New York International Independent Film and Video Festival was from the University of Alabama, Tuscaloosa. But she lived in New York. And she found me online because I had a premiere of my movie, at the Bama Theater in Tuscaloosa, and she found me online, early days of internet. And she was like, I didn't know anybody in Alabama was doing movies, I wanna help you out. So long story short with that is she um, introduced me to people like Chris Rock, Jennifer Aniston, George Clooney, Red Carpet Events, introduced me to people in the industry. And so I was still doing independent films when I was meeting people. So I was making a connection, but also making a name for myself and building my name. So fast forward, you know, several more years, almost a decade later, I'm still doing my own independent films, uh, not doing them for festivals because festivals don't mean anything. No offense to people that do festivals, but uh, so I started doing my own indies. But then the producers that I met in the industry, like in L.A. and Hollywood and stuff, were like, OK, uh, we want to come to your state and make a movie. Can you and your crew 
make a movie, you know, like a tier one or a tier two movie. We call them shows. Can y'all do a tier one or tier two shows? So when Alabama finally passed a tax incentive to attract investors and producers, by that time, I had already done so many indie films and my crew had already worked with me on so many. I'm like, my buddy Richie, I'm like, Richie, come up here, give us a chance. So he did one movie in Mobile. He uh, hired me on that one. And then when I told him everything that we have in Birmingham, which is bigger than Mobile, we have a bigger crew. He gave us a chance, and to this day, uh, he was coming back to Alabama with movie after movie, saying, Moon, we, we like what you're doing, we like your crew, we, we like what you guys know how to do, and so I learned the producing side of it, and I uh, was introduced to investors and uh, sales agents and things like that, and still doing my own independent films, but they're getting better, but now I'm helping bring movies to the state, like the Bruce Willis movies, the John Travolta movies. And uh, now we're hobnobbing with the um, with the main producers, and, and I'm learning, and they're teaching, and they're pleased with everything that Alabama has to offer, and that's and that's where I am now. Okay, so there's a lot to unpack there, right? There's, there's yes. a lot of history from 93 all the way to 2024. We're talking, you know, 30 years of, of wow. time frame, right? So, yep. you know, one of the things I wanted to ask you really quick before I dive back into the beginning was, uh, you stated that that film festivals you just kind of don't play in that field. What's the reason for that? Do you have like a sour taste with film festivals? Like, what's your reasoning behind not wanting to um, play in that pond? And the only reason why I ask that is because I feel like as, as a fellow filmmaker, every single project you have, you almost give yourself a lottery ticket to play, right? So if if any of us are able to get into a Sundance or a Tribeca or anything like that, it, it could help boost your career right but i'm under the the inclination that you know maybe they just don't watch most of our films <laughs> yeah ahead. no there's no bad blood or anything i've got nothing against festivals uh, if anything i don't like that people think they have the mentality that i'm going to get discovered which it never happens or my film's going to get picked up it never happens because i'll get to the business side later but, but no, there's this dreamy, starry-eyed, oh, I'm going to be the next big thing and the next big thing, and people don't realize that's not how it works. If you want to be in the industry, show them what you can do. Don't show them, okay, because they're going to nitpick your film to death no matter what, because you're never going to have a big enough budget to do something justice. So if you even if you do, like I've had um, my films have been kind and stuff like that as far as through my agents that are selling my films or representing my films, things like that, but... It's 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 a meat market, and all it is is. And if Ginger was on, I, I hope she's on now. I hope we just don't know if she's on. But I cannot stand this. Here's my pet peeve: so many indie filmmakers love to see their name and their picture in light, so they're going to put the name of their company, which is always their name, and they're going to put it on a little backboard, and then they're going to bring that to their premiere, and everybody that's in their movie is going to pose right in front of that little back, not backboard, backdrop. And it's going to say, like, JC Films. No offense to JC. I just happened to know JC Films. But it's got JC Films on there. And then you've got Dean Kane standing like this. And you've got uh, some local that, hey, I'm standing next to Dean. It's like, okay, we're all people. Everybody's people. Even the biggest name in the names in the industry, they're just people. Right. So if you want to make the connections, don't do it through the festivals. Just produce films and start introducing yourself to people in the business and attracting people to your state because if you build it they'll come and you're in atlanta they're already there right so all you have to do is just hook up with the right people because it's a very loyal industry um but yeah festivals are okay i mean but they're never going to make you they're never going to break you uh for indie filmmakers they might break you because most of us don't have budgets anyway and if you're spending a hundred dollars here for uh sundance or 75 here for con or whatever that's going to eat up a lot of your money and you're right. not going to be the success story that you're thinking that you are. And that's not not that's not to knock anybody. Right. But it's just if you're going into festivals thinking I'm going to be the next big thing, that's uh, that's not the way to do it. So let me that, ask that's you not this: the way to do uh, it. Yeah. It's the first time I've ever heard someone say in, in regards to the industry that it's very loyal. What do you mean by that? All right, hold on. Let me move this real quick. Up, oh, up. Oh, what did I lose you? Hold on. No, you're still. Yeah. All right, good. Steve, that was looking beautiful, Steve. <laughs> <laughs> all right, so um, so loyal. All right, loyal is this. Loyal is 
Okay, I've been a prop master on a lot of movies because the movies that I bring to the state, I don't always get the title that I want, like producer or anything like that, because if I'm not bringing money into it, uh, you know, okay, but I'm bringing everything else. I'm bringing my crew, I'm bringing my resources, I'm bringing You're producing you know, whatever I'm the product, but they just don't want to give you that yeah, title. Yeah, well, and there's a reason for it, because you don't want a whole lot of producer names in there because it does diminish your movie. If you pull up on IMDb or if you're watching the credits, that's why, like, if you're watching the, the card, the title card, you're not going to see all the producers' names listed because you don't want 20 names on there because, like, oh, well, y'all never raised enough money, so everybody and their brother had to uh, invest in it. But anyway, so a long story short is if you're loyal, you can make mistakes. Me as a prop master, I'm not perfect by any means at all. But the stuff that I can do is I'm going to be loyal to the producer. And I don't mean like blindly loyal, like you see them doing something wrong and you just, you know, whitewash it or cover it up or anything like that. I just mean loyal to, okay, well, man, you may have messed up on right here, but I need you to find me. Uh, a scissor lift from across the street, case in point, we were in a movie called um, uh, Office Uprising. And it's my buddy's uh, project. And so they're like, hey, we don't have a big budget. Moon, you know everybody in town. Can you do this for me? Uh, we need a boom lift uh, so that we can attach a light to it, but we don't have a big budget. So I walked across the street from where we were filming at the office building, and they were renovating the building next door. You know, we're from the South. You and me both are from the South. So I just walked up to him and said, hey, dude, we're making a movie. These are my friends. They come to Alabama a lot. Can you do me a favor? If y'all aren't using this boom lift, can I use that for a couple of hours? You know, that kind of stuff. And you get it for free because, yeah, they want to help out. We're not using a boom lift. So here, you guys can borrow it. Here's the key. Just return it when you're done. So that's the kind of loyal I'm talking about. It's like I'm loyal to get this project made. Right. If this project has to get made and you'd be surprised how many people will backstab you. Locals will backstab you. Um, and I don't mean all of them. I don't want to sound negative. I just want to be real with everybody. Sure. Locals, if you're doing something, I had somebody came in that said, oh, um, Joe, I can do everything that Steve can do, but um, I can do it better. And they're like, hey, Moon is the reason why we're here. We don't need you. Get off my set. So it's a very loyal, until you just like royally screw somebody because it's so hard to find good people. And I'm not saying I'm good people. I'm saying anybody that you have is good people. And it's hard to find that because this takes a dedication because you're only as good as your next, your last paycheck. So you might be working for six weeks and then you're out of work until the next show comes to town. Right. But if you're honest and you're loyal and you're doing everything you can. And then like, like when he called me and said, Hey Moon, can you guys do a dirt track race car movie about, um, Dirt track racing in Birmingham with John Travolta. I'm like, man, I went to Hueytown. I went to Pleasant Grove High School. Half of Hueytown, our neighboring city, still builds and races their own cars. So they flew in uh, Travolta, John Travolta, and they flew in the director. And me and my buddy David Hall, Ginger, if you're on, David Hall, there you go. We uh, we took him around and showed him the Talladega short track. We introduced him to all my friends in Hueytown that still build and drive their own race cars. And John Travolta's like, this is it. This is where I want to do this. And so that's the kind of loyalty that, okay, Moon, after we wrap this, I've got a show called Bigger about Joe Weider, and it's the uh, biography of Joe Weider who discovered Arnold Schwarzenegger. You want to meet the producer. So the producer comes in, and Richie's like, look, this is what Moon's doing. These are his crew. So I bring in my crew to the table, uh, or my keys to the table, and they meet the producers. And I'm like, yeah, we can do this. So we kept the same production office for two shows back to back because as soon as we were done with one, the next one uh, came in. So, let, so um, let, let, let's backtrack a little bit though. Okay. Um, what was, okay, so your first project or like the first five, 10 years, what, like, what was that like? Like, what was that moment like for you uh, that you decided, hey, I'm going to make this project because that first project essentially is what led to the other 30 projects right so oh yeah so where were you like what happened when you said hey i'm gonna do this where was i mentally or what mentally yes like 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 what was happening because i know where i was on my first project and i know what was was happening and how where like everything so like what was that defining moment for you that said hey i'm gonna go make this film i don't care what what it takes but i'm gonna go make this film well, you just you just answered right there. It's I don't care what it takes. I'm going to make this because you feel like you have a calling. I feel like everybody does have a calling in life. And I don't know that mine is necessarily making movies, 
but making a difference. And so I was like, okay, my director of photography was 20 and in college. And now, you know, 25 years or whatever later, uh, he's running a successful company here in Birmingham. And it's just, it's about my, my first one is I just want to do this. I want to prove that I can, I want to prove the doubters. And honestly, I also, um, my next couple of movies, the motivation was I was working in marketing and that was an industry that was downsizing because, you know, you're getting into the digital age kind of thing and you don't need everything that you did in marketing and marketing is not sales. So marketing is the first company, the first people that lay off. So I went through three, comp four companies, but three companies went out of business and one almost went out of business. So there, I got tired of being laid off. So I'm like, I'm going to do something that Worst case scenario, I can show it at a few independent theaters and I can make a little bit of money sure. because you can, you can, you can charge 10, $15 or whatever. Those people like to go see indie films. So that was kind of my mentality is let me have something to fall back on. But then it was like, okay, I'm, I'm, I'm good at this, but I'm not, I, I I'm a storyteller, but I'm still learning. But now I'm able to give. Now I'm able to give other people opportunities and they're learning. And then by the time three or four of those movies happened, it was like, okay, we're actually doing this. We're making independent films. We have arrived because everybody loves to call themselves a filmmaker. Right. And like we've done, we don't, we're not doing shorts. We're doing features right. and we're getting our name out there. And now you've got uh, people in the industry that are contacting you to say, hey, if we come up here, do you have your um, key grip? Is he available? And it's like, wow, this is why we do it. We don't do it for fame, fortune, glory, nothing. It's like, wow, we've created a little small industry. And uh, so each one just well, was further proof that, okay, I'm doing what I'm called to do, whether my movies take off or not, I'm still making a living doing what I'm doing because I'm bringing in the other producers to my state so that I can work with them sure. and pay my bills. So it was kind of a win-win. Yes, I'm doing, you know, decent independent films and each one gets better. And now, wow, wow, now, now which, some of these just off the chain. Which, I mean, one, it's a blessing that you're able to, to, to sustain it for so long and then be able to, to make money in this space. Um, but what what project and kind of where where were you in the essence of like which project was the project that kind of added a lot of momentum to your career? Which project that I did or yes. which project that I've brought to the state? No, uh, both. Let's do both. Which project did you do that really boosted your momentum? And then which project that you brought to the state of Alabama that really said, hey, Steve's the guy? Um, The one that I brought to the state that I guess put me, Steve's the guy, whatever you want to say, would be Trading Paint. That's the John Travolta movie. That was that was just, I mean, everything, all right, we, like, oh, where can you film? We'll film it in Bessemer. We'll film it in Hueytown. So we didn't need a location person. It was me. So that saved the producer's money. And again, you're going back to loyalty. So finding the race car drivers, finding the race cars, finding the, the dirt track is like, okay, Moon knows what he's doing. And I got to where I had a reputation where anything under $5 million moons the guy. So I built a reputation that, and because of all the other things that I was doing, I learned those things. I learned how to knock on a door because I don't care if you're doing, you know, a $10 independent film, you're still knocking on the door saying, Hey, can we film in your location? Or if you're doing a, a $5 million film, you're still knocking on the door. Hey, I'm Steve. The hustle doesn't well. change. No, not, none of that changes. None of that changes. Um, uh, Ginger, are you there? Because she says that she's on. Um, do we have Ginger? I don't know if we do or not. She just said that she's on now. Are you here, Ginger? Uh, Say something, Ginger. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, so there was no one that put me on the map. It was just my relationship with Richie. Richie uh, I don't even know how I met him. It had to have been through uh, the liaison of the New York Film Festival uh, because I think he was working with Anchor Bay Entertainment at the time. So he was kind of explaining me how things were, were going. You know what? I will say, all right, I'll say this. I wrote a project called Cotton. And in the state of Alabama, in the city of Birmingham, and in the ghetto of West End, Birmingham, Alabama. That title just white... does not mix. <laughs> no, no, it does not mix. But, man, here's the thing. So... I wrote a script called Cotton, 
And I got the interest of Veronica over at Tridestin Studios. I'm a white dude. You know, this is years ago, years and years and years ago. And so um, it was about, and, and the script never had, or developed, and I'll tell you why in a second. But that, all right, that's the one that did it because it was about a white paramedic in his 30s that loves Cotton Avenue District because Cotton Avenue District in Birmingham is in the ghetto. It is in West End. It is in the hardcore part of town, but he loves what he does. So he's one of four white characters in the whole movie, but the movie's not about race. It's not about racism. It's not about anything. What it is, it's about a white character who discovers that his boss is inadvertently in bed with a crooked mayor who is saying, hey, look, um, you don't have to bid to be a uh, ambulance company in in Birmingham if you'll do this for me. You scratch my back, I'll scratch yours. And it turns out they were billing Medicare. They were billing the insurance company. They were billing the patient. And it was just making all this money hand over fist. But the way race came in wasn't even race. The character's name was Tommy, the white dude. And, he, and his partner's name is Jamal. And he's like, Jamal, look, I can expose this right now. But you and I both know if I expose this, I'm a racist. But I'm not a racist because I live in, in, in this town and I do this and I don't want to lose lives. And if our ambulance company shuts down, who's going to go out and rescue the people in the community? So he's he's kind of stuck. OK, what do I do? Uh, so it wasn't a racist anything. I, you know, I'm very politically incorrect. I'm old school. I grew up in the 80s. Uh, when the movie White Men Can't Jump Wait, came so, out. So why, why, why uh, was Cotton never made? All right, why was Cotton never made? Uh, Cotton was never made because we had an investor who wanted to bring in his money, and he wanted to direct it. And I'm not for sale, let alone my philosophy on things are not for sale. So he was from either India or Egypt, and he wanted to change the script. And so... Um, Jamal's character, and this is, I'll make this real short. Jamal's character is uh, is also a paramedic, but he's also uh, a nurse going to be, no, he's going to nursing school. And his girlfriend is black, but she is also an alcoholic and she has a dad that's dying of cancer. And Jamal is studying to be a cancer research scientist and all this. And the investor said, no, we want him to date a... Um, uh, a white nurse mm -hmm. and Veronica over at Tridestin said, no, that's racism right there. You can't have a black man turn his back on his community and on his girlfriend and turn a blind eye to the fact that his girlfriend's dad has cancer and he's going to be a research scientist for cancer. No, that's racism right there. So um, it lingered on for a couple of years. And finally I was at a Birmingham Southern basketball game because I love their basketball and uh, we were on the phone and we fired him and because we already had distribution. We had everything lined up. That was, it was the talk of the town for the year that went to American film market. Everybody was talking about that script. So, okay. So you fired the investor who wanted oh, yeah. to be the director at the yeah. basketball game, but then yep. uh, it was the talk of the town, but yet the movie, you made the movie or you didn't make the movie? No, we did not make the movie because of that reason right there. Uh, so I never touched it again after that. It's still there. It still exists. I don't know, you know, 15 years later, if it still carries the power, because there's a lot of there's a lot of old school humor in there. And what I was going to say earlier is like me and my buddies that grew up and played basketball and stuff like that. We love white men can't jump. I'm a big Wesley Snipes fan to this day. And so like Tony and Martez and stuff were hey, here in did college. You, did you see Blade? Uh, I'm not, not played. I'm sorry. Deadpool and Wolverine. Did you like seeing? Uh, did you see it? No. I, wait. Okay, no. Which mind, one? De Deadpool. No. Okay. Never mind. Never mind. Go ahead. All right. <laughs> so anyway, we're like, uh, so Tony Martez and, and they're black, and I was like, hey, hey, mom. That's what we call Martez. Hey, mom. Why don't we make a sequel called Black Man Can't Swim? And that line is in the movie because I grew up in a time where, you know, we were in the eighty in the nineteen eighties. We didn't. I hate saying that we don't see color because. That doesn't it. That phrase is just so overused. But it's like we could joke about things with each other, and there wasn't everybody was offended. And most of the guys that I went to high school and college with are far more successful than me and are about to retire. And I'm still trying to get my career off the ground. So there's a lot of that kind of I don't know what kind of humor you would call that, but it's just it's just directness in in the movie. And would today's you, society, everybody's so would you, that? Say, would you say that that humor um follows your current work or it's kind of stuck within that time frame 
Oh, well, well, one thing has nothing to do with the other. And it's not really humor. It's just things that you can and cannot say uh, because of the woke community now. Everything is woke. Everybody's offended. And most people are offended on behalf of someone that's not offended. So I don't think it would go over as well now. But no, the stuff that I'm doing now is is um, gangbusters. I mean, the stuff that I'm doing now is we did a... Um, I helped Birmingham Southern College no longer exists. They went out of business after like 120 years, but I helped their film students. And so we did a movie called Diamond. Diamond we shot in one day. Why did we shoot it in one day? Feature film shot it in 12 and a half hours, including lunch. Here's why we shot it one day. There is a production manager that comes to Birmingham and a UPM, you know, their job is to kind of run things behind the scenes. But she says this to everybody. She's mean as a snake. She says, Nobody in Alabama knows what they're doing. They'll never amount to anything. They'll never be anything other than assistance. They're never going to climb the ladder. That's why you guys can't do anything. That's why we have to bring in people from Atlanta or we have to bring in people from L.A. So I'm like, you know what? You know, hold, hold my clapper. So I get a crew of about eight and I say, OK, we're going to make this movie. It takes place in one location, but we're going to use several parts of the location. It's a bar inside, outside, upstairs, downstairs, whatever. Anybody up for it? And so my sound guy. Me, uh, a team of four camera operators, a second unit person, a UPM, not a UPM, but a um, first AD. And my first AD has, um, oh, uh, can I ever remember what autism? She has functional autism. And she had just graduated from Birmingham Southern. So I put her in charge and she said, okay, this is what you have. You have this many minutes to shoot each scene and we're not going to do it uh, in time. So we made our entire movie. We made our entire day. Uh, roughly 80 pages. It originally was 72, but we added pages because we had time. And the movie's phenomenal. And it's called Diamond. And it's about a 1970s era uh, former rock star who's now an alcoholic. Is it out now like on it. Amazon Prime and Tubi and stuff? Uh, it's it's going to be out there. We're still doing deliverables for it. Okay. Uh, but I have a sales agent. I uh, went to um, Con. And hopefully we've made enough connections to get it in some decent markets. Would but a uh, phenomenal movie, would and you Ginger say, Cressman was in it. Would you, What's that? No, I was going to say, would you say that for the indie filmmakers out there, that getting a sales agent is more beneficial than just uploading their film on Film Hub or something like that? Uh, both. What I will say about Film Hub is something that I learned. Um, I met Ginger Cressman. Hold on. We, and, um, wait, hold on, hold on. The, it, it cut out after you said both i met G and then it cuts to so start from there okay yeah so i met ginger cressman on the set of a movie in mississippi called joe baby uh i knew the producer i'd worked with him before so he brought me on to do i was armor and i was prop master and ginger was an actress and i knew that i was a director so we kind of met and stuff like that but um long story short is uh about a year or so ago year and a half ago i called him and i was like look you know how do we sell films if we can't sell films. And he said, the biggest thing that we can recommend is Film Hub. And this is from a producer that does the multi-million dollar movies. So when he said Film Hub is the best place for indie filmmakers, I absolutely wholeheartedly agree with that. Because he's saying, look, we're doing stuff that's like 500,000 and a million that's not getting sold anywhere with people like Mickey Rourke and uh, a talent like that attached. So we're going the Film Hub route and it, it's very beneficial. So, yes, I would say do that. But I would, I would also say get a sales agent. But if you're going to get a sales agent, your movie better be good. And if I can say this, production design, production design, production design. So many people are like, oh, well, my mom's giving me her house or my cousin has a house that we can film in or I, I have a, a cousin that has a bar. Okay, don't just film in that. Make it like here's a room. I'm in my room right now, but I would not film in this room unless I designed this room to the standards of what a Hollywood film should look like. And nobody takes that into account. And also, everybody loves to brag on the red. Great camera. Film on whatever you have, but get good glass. Get good lenses. I was, I was going to ask you about that. <laughs> yes. All right, go ahead. You ask. I'm talking way too much. No, now. no, you're good. I love it. I love it. Now, I was going to ask you, okay, so... I have these these internal debates and conversations all the time. Um, yes. As a filmmaker, I shot my original film on the Black Magic Pocket Cinema Camera 6K. Then, hold on, I think somebody might be trying to join. That's probably her. Ginger! Yeah, well, I admit. Let her on. 
Oh, woo! Oh my goodness, did it work? Yes, it is. I can see. How her. are you doing, I Jason? Hey, I'm good. How are you? Good. Thank you very much. Okay, so I have to make an adjustment really quick on the broadcaster. Do okay. what you gotta do, yeah. Um, let's. See. I like to sing, by the way. No worries. <laughs> Let me make this adjustment really quick. Okay. Okay, no, no, you can see y'all. Okay, we're good. Let me see if I can minimize my screen. Uh, there we go. Okay. Okay, this works. Okay, awesome. All right, everybody, this is Ginger Cressman. She is an actress. Um, welcome. You're a little late, but welcome. Uh, I am a little late, and thank you very much. Okay, so well, I, I'm gonna let's finish that question, and then we can go into Ginger um, okay. and, and what she does in her history and all that stuff, and then we can tie it in with you, Moon. Um, yeah. So when it comes to cameras, I shot uh, my last one of my last features on the red the red Komodo, and then after that uh, project, I went and sold it, and then I went back to Black Magic. I always tell people this and, and then tell me your philosophy or your thought process on it. I'm like cameras within the last four years are so good that it doesn't matter anymore. Like the little nuance of shooting on an Ari Alexa compared to a red Komodo compared to a black magic 6k, unless you tell the audience like, Hey, this is an Ari. No one's going to be like, Oh, that's an Ari. Yeah. I know, I'm here. You keep going. Keep going. Cause I got to look something up real quick. Okay. Go um, ahead. Look, look, look it up. Okay, you know what? Let me go, Ginger. So, out of yeah. all the projects you've done, what project um, that you've enjoyed the most, and what camera did they shoot on? If you know. Oh goodness. Um, so the project I've enjoyed all of my projects, just about almost all of them. Okay, but I don't know what all y'all have talked about so far. Did you already talk about just, diamond? Basically, just my background briefly. How I met you on Joe Baby. We did talk about diamond. I did say you were the star of Diamond, and that's as far as we got. We're going to get to Diamond, but we but uh, we, we, we sidetracked to the equipment because all the yes. filmmakers want to always uh, talk about equipment. Okay, so whenever y'all do talk about Diamond, that was one of my favorites. I have no earthly idea what they shot on, and also I most of the time have no earthly idea what equipment people are using because I don't pay attention to that. As an actress, I just pay attention to... Um, all the things that I need Wait, to do. So I don't know. One of your favorites? What? One of your favorites? <laughs> anyway. Yeah. So go, Let's go continue. Yeah, go ahead, Scott. Scott, Steve. That's why you I'm sorry, sorry, sorry. You're my bad, Steve. Oh, uh, that's why the message said Scott. Now I get it. Yeah. Okay. Oh, it said Scott. I didn't see that. See? No, just call me Moon. That'll be easier. Moon is easier. See, I told you. Moon's easier. That's right. All right. So, all right. Here's my flaw. Here, here, and Ginger will back me up on this. You cannot tell indie filmmakers anything, especially directors. You can't tell them anything because they get their panties in a wad, they get their feelings hurt. And I don't live in a world where, hey, facts don't care about your feelings. I'm old school. It's like I tell them the same thing that you did because if you look at the movie, this is what I had to pull up, Mobland. Mobland with John Travolta. Horrible. I couldn't even get past the first five minutes. I can shoot better than that holding my little small Sony camera, my Canon camera. So I tell people all the time, dude, it's all about the glass. It's about the lighting. And Ginger, I did get into production design. I, I love that we can film yeah. inside your friend's house, but guess what? It had the production value that we needed. When we did another movie in Mobile, Mobile, was it Mobile where we shot Across the Sky? Fairhope? Fair the latest Hope. house was in Mobile. Mm -hmm. It's you have to take everything into consideration. So get good glass, good lenses. I don't care what camera you use. I used a Sony VX1000 a long time ago that, um, uh, what's his name? Uh, played, uh, what's his name? Um, Ron Howard. Ron Howard's people thought, oh, did you shoot that on Super 16? No, that was the Sony VX1000. So you make it work with what you can. And that camera didn't even come with lenses. I would have to go literally from across the room, zoom in as tight as I can to get that shallow depth of field. Sure. So, and, so let me ask you this then. Yeah. If, if, if you were working on your first film right now and you had a budget of $2,000 to spend on a camera, what camera would you buy? And then what lens would you buy? Oh, this is fun. That, 
I would give that two thousand dollars to my actress. I would give it for food, and I would give it for whatever we need, crafty or a hotel or something like that. And I would go to a pawn shop, and I would find the nicest camera that I could get for around three or four hundred dollars, <laughs> and I would get good glass because right now I'm shooting on a Sony uh, can't is it Sony? It's Canon, a Canon two K camera right now. And nobody in the world knew that it was a 2K. They're like, what? Nobody knew. They thought it was 4K. Because here's the lesson that you have to know. As an indie filmmaker, it doesn't matter what you shoot on because your deliverables are all going to be done at 2K. So even if you have 6K or 8K and you're an indie guy, look at Mobland. Mobland looks horrible. I mean horrible, but it's a John Travolta film. 2V plays but everything at 720 anyways. <laughs> it looks like garbage. Yeah, and, and your TV is going to broadcast it for most of Yeah, so 2K. So, so I would say just go out and get what you can afford because we've shot on my iPhone that people can't. That's your iPhone? How'd you do that? Because it's garbage in, garbage out. It, it's the operator. Uh, it's everything that goes into it. You can have, you can have the, um, the Airy Alexa Mini. Great camera with anamorphics. Great lens, best lenses. Um or going back to old school, you can have a Panavision and shoot on three per Super 35 film and get you this great looking texture. But if you don't know what you're doing, if you don't have the production design, if you don't have the right lighting, another thing, indie film guys never light anything. They're going to overblow everything. It's like, okay, I don't want to see, like right now, Ginger, you look great. But if we were filming, I wouldn't shoot that back wall and I would kind of sidelight you. And then, oh, well, that looks cinematic. So, yeah, don't don't be so caught up in what the camera is because at the end of the day, it's what does it look like on screen. That's your glass. That's your lighting. That's your talent. And so, we, yes. Uh, yeah, out of ahead. all that, where would you rank? Like, okay, if you had to go glass, talent, lighting, set design, how would you rank it all? You have to go, like, one through five. Like, okay, this is number one. This is number two. How would you rank it all? All right, tied for number one is going to be glass and talent. Okay. Because everybody thinks they're an actor. Oh, I'm an actor. Well, you might be an actor, but you're not a good actor. And I'm not, please don't, I know I'm sounding negative because I'm not. It's just I've been around a time or two. And um, like with Ginger, Ginger is one of those people, she hates when I say this, but this is why I wanted you to be on the call. Ginger has that it factor. She has that what you're looking for in talent. Everything that she's in, she plays something different. She's not the same person. She knows the craft. So tied for first would be glass and your talent. Okay, then second would be production design and lighting. They go uh, hand in hand. Give, you I don't care give how me two ties. You're giving me two ties right now. I have, have to, to like... have to because, <laughs> because you're going down two different roads. So um, so you have to because you can have all the glass in the world, but if I cast the wrong person for my movie, the movie's going to look like garbage. It might sure. look good, but okay, if, if, if I have somebody other than the girl right in front of us right now, it's not going to tell the same story. So your glass is telling the story, your talent's telling the story. Your lighting is telling the story, uh, as well as your production design is telling your story. Look at where Ginger's sitting, look where I'm sitting. Where would you rather be? Something that has those nice little posters in the background or my little flat wall. So, uh, so yeah, so I would do that. Um, so so, let, so me, uh, let me ask you this, Ginger. Um, so you're the star of Diamond, a project that you shot with Moon. And this is the this is the project you guys shot in what you said twenty four hours, no twelve and a half including and breakfast, half including lunch and crafty. Okay, so yeah. what what I guess uh, intrigued you about Diamond? What made you want to play this character? What was it like? Give me the all encompassing answer. I want you to just like dive deep into like as an actress, you're like okay. We're gonna shoot this in twelve hours, which is so damn ambitious. Like I, I thought I shoot fast. That is faster than I can even imagine. So and go, go ahead and Ginger, I'm in. not here, so pretend I'm not here. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So, all right. Well, first of all, I did not know that we were going to be filming it in a day until I already was the character, and we were already very close to filming. 
So if I had known that from the get-go, would I have agreed to it at this point? Yeah, now that I've worked with him before. But if I had not uh, ever worked with him and he was like, hey, at this point, yeah, I would do that because I like to do random fun um, challenges. But if I had known that, I don't know at the time. But when I read the script, I mean, it was just a beautiful script. The scripts that he writes are always very, um, they're full of depth. And they're very rich. And this character was very rich. And I identified with some of the things that, that she went through in my own way also. So I liked being able to bring that to um, to her when we filmed it. But honestly, just most of the things that he writes, they're all rich and deep characters. And I really got to know who she was ahead of time. And I love that. So, so what so what what was it about this character that made really, you know, captured you and, and made you say, hey, you know, I, I can bring this character to life and I can bring what Moon wants and I want to play this character. Moon, you have to give me this character. Like, what was it about this character that did that for you? Ooh, that's such a hard question, especially with him staring at me. Uh, so, not, I, Moon, look I, I want to turn in so bad, but you go. Okay. So anyway, the really, I, I was nervous about playing the character, but I really wanted to. So she is an alcoholic. She is a rock star. All of those I know are going to be very difficult to play. I'm not a singer, although I did fine with those parts of it. Um, but as far as the character goes, it was just the whole story. I, I liked the story. It was like a day in a real person's life and i felt like i could dig in there and really challenge myself to be able to become to become her she is different from me in a lot of ways i but i i just there's some things i can find ways that i can connect with characters and there are some things about her that i could connect with so and plus besides that too it was set in the 70s and i love period pieces so anytime i see those i'm a little bit extra excited you're, you're excited you get you, as a female you get to dress up right sure. Yes, so, exactly. so you, you look like you want to say something. Go ahead. No, well, no, I don't want to say something. I'm just so freaking proud of her because we met on Joe Baby, which you know more about Joe Baby than I do. I was just there screwing up and trying not to get fired. But um, <laughs> I, I just knew when I saw her that this, because I had that script for years, and I just knew when I saw her, I was like, that's what I've been looking for. We can't hear you, so <laughs> so when looking for is where you stopped off at. Just know that. Okay, now we can see you and hear you. Okay, go ahead. Okay, you just knew she was uh, what you were looking for. Uh, yeah, it just it's one of those things that you just know. It's a look. It's as a writer and as a director, you always think and post. Uh, uh, I, again, I'm not saying I'm good. I'm just saying a good writer, a good director will always think and post. How is this going to look in the end? How is this going to tell that story? And I didn't even have to think or blink an eye. I was like, okay, this is what I'm looking for. And I, I don't know that I didn't tell her that we were doing it in one day. I don't know if I was afraid that if I did tell her, she would back out. I, I don't know the answer to that part. But um Again, it goes back to filming it in one day is is when uh, Mary was saying nobody in Alabama, you know, you guys can barely make uh, seven pages in one day. OK, watch this. But what just to watch her become this character and the camaraderie on set and this everybody, because we run a professional set, but we also have fun. You know, nobody needs to yell at people, even though uh, my first AD, hey, Moon, you got five minutes to do that scene. And I'm like, well, no, hold on. I'm talking to Ginger. I'm talking to Juliet. We're getting the pizza ready. And Moon, you got four minutes and 28. Okay. All right. Never mind. I'm going to do it. So what, what, so, back, back to technology though. What did you guys shoot this on? Diamond. Uh, we shot that on, I know two Sonys, a black magic. And the third was either a Sony or a Canon. Okay. So but you, one got, of you guys multi-canned it to kind of get that, that time. Right. I'm thinking that's the only way to do 12 hours. Right. <laughs> yeah, well, what you do, it, well, I knew, I knew I could do it. I wasn't concerned about doing it because we already had the breakdown. And we're like, okay, we're going to shoot this, we're going to shoot this. And they, you know, there's not there's not a lot of time where you go behind the scenes, hey, Ginger, I need to talk to you about your character. You think she's, no, no, don't need to tell her anything because I'll get long-winded. But what we did is we split it up into two units. So um, I kind of made, depends on who's listening to this podcast um, or watching it, I kind of made a mistake of putting my two people that I've never worked with on the same team running camera 
and the two that I had worked with on the same team. I should have split that up with, you know, Cassidy and the other guy on A team and then Cricket and the other guy on B team. Uh, but overall, it did well. What I enjoyed the most is it has a 70s feel. And we had a premiere in South Carolina uh, a few weeks ago, about a month ago, and there was an older gentleman that knew right away that it had that 70s look. I wanted the clothing because I picked out wardrobe for it. It worked out perfectly on her. Um, just it, it had that look that it was supposed to have. So it just it all came together. And I'm going to turn it back over to Ginger because Ginger is the one that had to memorize not only the lines, but her acting is so honest that you don't oh this is oh wow this is almost quoting jd you don't Actually, know where move to left a little bit. hold on hold on move yeah. to left a little bit there we go yeah okay quoting jb go ahead all right uh jd's a character in there and uh named after jd sumner the stamps he was the bass singer for elvis and all them anyway um there's a line in there where he's like i, I don't know where um you begin and diamond ends or something like that and and, and you can't tell and i get excited so i lose my train of thoughts and my words but you can't tell where where Ginger ends and her character begins because it's and remind me to come back to the waterboard, not the waterboard scene, but the other one where the fireman said, Are you okay? Anyhow, so you watch Ginger just do this, and it's like, wow, I I've wa wow, this is honest. This is not acting. This is a human being being the person she's supposed to be. And and people look all their lives. For somebody that that has that kind of gift, as, as a writer, kind of as a writer director, do you get excited like being that you wrote this thing from your imagination, you brought it to the page, and then you have an actress like Ginger come on set and deliver everything that you've ever wanted? Do you feel like you get giddy inside? Uh, not for me, I don't. I get giddy for them doing it because it's about it's about them. It's not about me. I don't, don't get me wrong. Yes, I absolutely diamond. I, I watch all the time. I love diamond and i love how we did it but no it's like it's like watching your kids grow or watching your kids shoot a three-pointer and get fouled and then go to the free throw line and, and make it an and one so they just scored four it's like you watch them do that right. and to watch that and, and watch the people put it together it's like it's like watching the sunset and and i'm watching her on anything that she does is like that yeah i have a gift because that it that came out wrong. I I get I'm the recipient of a gift because they've given me something. Um, I tell Ginger all the time. I feel like I'm taking advantage of people because this is my dream. This is my idea, <laughs> and y'all are giving me what I want. But it's not about that. It's about look at you. Uh, you've got Diamond is this beautiful character that everybody's gonna fall in love with when they watch the movie. And um, what did what did yeah, you, so, what did you use Ginger like? I guess, what did you use to tap into this Diamond character? So, um, in the story, I don't know if I'm supposed to tell what happened. Go ahead. Okay. So, in the story, she finds out that she had lost her dad. So, that was one of the things I I had lost my mom two years before we shot the film. And, and I did so, not know that. And he didn't know that, of course, when he was casting me for that character. But that was... I try not to access that most of the time as an actress when I'm trying to get into my emotions. But for that, I did because it was a similar, you know, too, too similar of a circumstance to not touch on that. So some of the parts of it, honestly, filming for me were hard. I cried because it was hard. Um, so I didn't have to dig that deep for some of the moments. <laughs> as, as a performer, you understood the nuances of this character because you lived the nuances of this character. Yes, exactly. And I did say that I don't know that I would have taken it knowing it was going to be 12 hours if I didn't know that. But after doing it, I loved it because I was able to stay in character for just that whole day. I didn't have to change anything. I didn't have to go back and reaccess whatever moment I was in on some other day on some other scene. I just got to stay that way until the film was completed. So it felt like there was I was able to be the same diamond the whole time and not have to go back and try to find her again. I actually love that. So uh, let me ask you this, um, Moon. Uh, Lee, uh, go to your left again. You're kind of off camera. Okay. Yeah. Okay, there you go. Perfect. Um, so like, 
you you have this project, you create this project, you have all of these this, this filmography from from spanning back, you know, two thousand eight. Like you just have all of these projects. What made you, besides that lady saying, "Hey, you can't do this. You guys can't clear seven pages." What made you say, like say, write Diamond and say, "Okay, we're making Diamond compared to any other story that you currently have in your repertoire, like Cotton or anything else that we haven't spoken about?" What made you pull the trigger on Diamond? Well, Diamond was easy because all the elements were there. I knew it took place in one location. Um, even though we maximized on purpose, even if we'd shot it in 10 days, we were still going to film everything that we did. I wouldn't have changed really anything about it. Um, I knew we were going to use outside. I knew we were going to use the front. I knew we were going to use the back. Uh, I knew we were going to use the little alley, the upstairs for her dressing room because we had already scouted that location. So when I was like, wow, this is, this is a one location shoot. This is so easy because I've been doing it for so long. I know I don't want to say I know everything because I don't. So I know that, okay, if I give Ginger this long to do this and we move on to this, and if I have um, my first AD putting everything in order that I need to shoot in, and I know what I'm shoot shooting and who's directing which scenes, et cetera, then, uh, then it was just a no-brainer. And then it just came down to, again, kind of spite because everybody's sick of um, the UPM telling us what we can and can't do. And, and yes, we can. We just we don't have all those opportunities that like in Atlanta or Louisiana or in L.A. has. Hi. But we have the same gift. We have the same talent. Do you got would you, OK. Do you guys have other projects lined up? Because I feel like you guys do. I feel like you guys have other projects lined up together. <laughs> A never-ending of uh, lined up projects. <laughs> yeah. Um, do you want to go or do you want me to go? Oh, no, you go, man. He's the creative mind and I get to become the character. And isn't, isn't that such a... Always, there are always new projects in, in but the as, as an actress, as a performer, isn't that like awesome that you linked up with your director <laughs> and then you yes. get to go and perform in all these different projects? Yes, I love every second of it. I love it. If he wants to be like, hey, can you come up here and film this thing that we want to work on? Yes, thank you. Somebody that wants to get up and work. Yeah. Yeah. Well, no, we have several that we've done that I'll mention it now, but I'll come back to those. But we have one that we just did and we wrapped and we're doing deliverables for now as soon as somebody and her husband watches it again. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but it's called Our Final Hour. And it is, um, we, Ginger and I love a challenge. We love a challenge. We didn't have a script. We just started shooting one day and like, let's make a story and, and make it work. So the story is kind of like a born identity meets, what's the Denzel? I'm going to get it wrong. Safe house. And it is about, it's about um, a woman, it's about Ginger's character who, uh, we, we live in a time right now when Christianity is under fire. So I made this fictional um, arm of the government called the Department of Religious Extremism, but they only go after Christians. So now you're living in modern 2024, Ginger is an underground Christian that everybody in the government is after because she's spreading the gospel. She's preaching. Uh oh. She has to avoid getting arrested the whole time. So we're like, let's let's just shoot this, and uh, we did, and it turned out. So you guys shot that movie already too? Shot that one. Uh, it's not out yet. We're we are doing deliverables. Um, Ginger and her husband are my eyes and ears on any sound issues or uh, technical mistakes that I've made that I haven't caught, so that I can go back and fix those to uh, do the film hub. But no. So now going back, and then uh, then we'll go to the future. Going back, we did one called Below Water. Ginger and I both love kayaking. We love the outdoors. So we were in my kayak, and I, she has one of mine. So we're in our kayaks, and we're like, you know what? Let's make a movie in Oak Mountain State Park in Birmingham, Alabama. So we're like, what can we make? And we shot it on my, my cell phone. And it's about a woman that dives in shallow water and doesn't surface for a while. And when she does come to the surface, she doesn't know where she is. But we're like, what can we do to make this thing different? Okay. Let's have no dialogue in the entire movie, and you're the only character. So for <laughs> an hour and 20 minutes, we have to figure out, okay, how do we make a movie? Um, how do we make her survive? How do we make her confused? How do we make her try to get out of the situation? And what do we do when she finally does survive and surface? So um, when you watch the movie, it's all Foley, because everybody and their mama were kayaking and swimming. 
swimming and playing and doing everything in the water right beside us. So literally, if I have a wide shot right outside a frame, is some kid doing a cannonball on the beach. So we did that one. Uh, we did a 50-state film. Steve or Moon, what's a 50-state film? Um, I've always wanted a challenge. We love challenges. So I spent a while looking on Facebook trying to find a filmmaker of sorts on from every 50, all the 50 states. And Ginger's character, she played a woman dying of cancer that didn't want to die under hospice care. She wanted to go see the United States and travel. So she travels. So what we did is we shot a lot of it in Mississippi and Alabama, Birmingham, places like that. But when you watch the entire movie, ADR might be an actor from Ohio that says, oh, the gloves, they're on aisle 19. The foley from her window being rolled down might be from Washington State. Or when she's like clapping her hands, the audio might have been recorded from somebody from Nebraska. So a filmmaker from each of the 50 states contributed behind the scenes to this film. And when you watch it, you would never know that all 50 states were involved. So that was another challenge. So uh, I'll say this real quick. Go to Tubi and type in Ginger Cressman, and it'll pull up her movies. And I want you to watch Below Water. I'll say it again. Watch Below Water. Below Water. Let me pull That's the one that we did at Oak Mountain. Let me pull up that Tubi app. Yep. (laughs) And then, and some of these are on Amazon Prime also. Uh, Below Water, Light Drama. Like gloves for the cold, uh, because when she walks in, that's the name of the movie. She's like, "Do you have gloves? Like gloves for the cold?" Uh, outstanding movie. Lo- love that one uh, for the challenge. Ginger, you go ahead now because I'm kind of all dancing all over the place. Yes, your turn now, Ginger. Oh, what am I supposed to talk about now? The stuff that we've done, the stuff we're doing. Oh, okay. Well, am I missing yeah. anything else that's on Amazon Prime that we should oh, talk about? Yeah. Um. So yeah, lies buried inside. Yes, another fun one. So, okay, so how many projects have you guys done together? Moon, lean to your left. Yeah, there you go. Um, Five or six, I guess. Four or five. Okay, right and how many do you guys have coming? All right, we have a we have two big ones coming. Ginger, can I or you? You go. I'll, All right. I'll talk. I, I'll make this one fast. I'm a World War II junkie. I'm a historian. Um, the biggest battle of all the four or five years of the war was... In 1944, it was the Battle of Bastogne, also called the Battle of the Bulge. 16 days, the Americans were surrounded by by Germans on all seven roads. All seven roads were cut, so the Americans had nowhere to go. We had no food because we didn't have enough supplies. We didn't have uh, enough ammunition. We didn't have enough warm blankets or clothing or anything. And because of the snow and the canopy and everything, they couldn't drop any supplies. Ginger is playing the real-life nurse, Nurse Renee, who for like, I think you were there for five or six days before you finally died. Nurse Renee was one of two nurses that they didn't have any aid stations. They didn't have anything like that at all. So they had a makeshift hospital in the basement of a uh, drugstore. And so it was one medic, no, it was was one doctor that was a surgeon from the States. Uh, Nurse Renee was from France in Bastogne and there was a black nurse from the Congo. And that was it. And that was, they, they were taking care of every wounded soldier that was coming in and it's a true story and it's one of the most beautiful things i've ever seen and to have ginger playing the nurse on that so that's coming that's, that that it yeah we're still in prep for that there's still a lot of things that need to be done uh ginger what else do we have coming up um you know, origin, on spot. origin finishing origin origin is about the uh origin of vampires in bulgaria in the 1100s uh, so, um, so that, I, I noticed that a reoccurring theme about you. You like to do set pieces based on time periods. Diamond was in oh, the I, I love history, man. Yeah, okay. I love history. But then there's what? Well, we have something else that's um, oh, chasing. chasing rain. All right, chasing rain. I'd say this she plays a kayaker that is this outdoor, earthy girl. She lives in a camper, man, and she's just having a good time, but she's also a jewel thief, and she loves the heist, but she doesn't do heist anymore until one of her old friends comes up and say, look, I'm in a situation. If you don't steal this jewelry from me, I'm going to jail for 30 years. I need your help. So she's like, okay, I'll help you. So she plays a kayaking jewel thief, so it's a cross between the score with Robert De Niro, Point Break with Patrick Swayze, and um, 
Oh, oh, the River Wild. So, so uh, Ginger, you just get your pick now at this point, right? <laughs> I can't help it. We make good movies together. What can I say? <laughs> I mean, that's like, you know, for the actors out there, for the aspiring actors out there, that's kind of like, that's like the, the I'm not going to say the dream, right? Because we all want to be on the on, on the, the biggest Hollywood movies like Dune or whatever. But let's get that out of the equation. That's like the dream to just find your director, your producer. That's like, hey, I want to work with you. Let's make a career together. Yes, that, that is so true. I, I mean, I love it. You can't, really can't beat that. And what are you wanting to say over there? <laughs> it goes into what he was talking about, though. Talk about your real and what it's done for you and the advice that, that the others need to hear. Okay, so, um, <laughs> so. The importance, I mean, I could say it, but I want it to come from you. Yeah, okay, well, anyway, I have a really good reel that he put together with um, footage from different things that we've done and then, that I've done, and since I've gotten that, yeah, it's super important for actors to have a good reel to show what you can do because since I've gotten that, that's helped me get my agent. And that also she has gotten me some really fantastic auditions. And who's your agent? Uh, also. My agent? Yeah. Who Sorry. Are you, who are you with? They're called Rare Quality. Okay. Talent. Shout mm -hmm. out to Rare Quality. Cool. I didn't yeah. know if you could say that or not. So I was like, proceed with Tommy. Oh, cool. like, yeah, Donna's fantastic. No, she's wonderful. I'm sure she would appreciate that. Um, but yeah, it it has helped me a lot. And and a random thing it, that I've heard that's good advice is you're only as good as the worst thing on your reel. So putting footage from some of your practice or whatever semi okay things on your reel is not a good idea. It's actually a better idea to have a shorter reel shorter, without yes. just to put it on there to look like you've had work. That's just a Side so, note. so as a, as an actor, you know, now speaking to all the actors out there, what would it was? Would you say that reel is, is so valuable, and that's been the game changer in you booking your agent, booking work, and things of that nature? Number one is good headshots because you can't look professional without it. So that is number one. Would but you say the headshots, that, the headshots supersede the reel. Yes, because that's the first thing that casting directors see. They look, they see your picture. If it looks like you took it with your phone, you're not going to look anywhere near as professional as somebody who actually spent a little bit of money or time. <laughs> can, something. can I just tell you something really quick? What's so funny about you saying this? Okay. Um, yeah. So here's what's so funny. Um, so because I, I, so I've been in the industry since 2006, I've done national commercials, big print campaigns for the biggest companies, films, all this good stuff. Um, that now I'm in the space where like, I just create my own projects and you know, I'm not really too concerned, but my real is better than my cell phone headshot that I have. Cause I'm like, cause I'm sitting there and I'm like, listen, this is what I look like. Just look at the real. <laughs> You needed to hear that. You need to go tomorrow and get some good headshots. That's a fact. That is a fact. It is. But a good reel, of course, once they get past, because I've had too many casting director workshops and things where they say they just swipe you away if they don't like your picture. So, um, anyways, but yeah, once you get the good reel, then there you go. Then that's awesome. So, you do definitely need both of them. Because she's had auditions. I know we can't say the names, but she has had auditions for household name uh talent that are you know theatricals 2000 screens oh yeah yeah and, and you know what another thing i just want to uh stress to the actors out there is like man that's a win just to get into that room and audition whether you get it or not is a win yes it, that is so true it is so hard to actually get the the big auditions with people that everybody knows who is like i mean that's amazing but anyway even getting an audition on a small project is like a victory yeah, you know, oh, yeah. What's fascinating about it is it took me, you know, uh, like 13 years to understand this and get to a, a certain point in life where I'm like, listen, you not getting the project has nothing to do with your talents. Not, not to say that you didn't have a bad audition or you just sucked at that moment. That's not saying that that's not the case. But a lot of the times you can give a stellar audition and hit every beat and look great and you're still not going to get it for whatever reason. Yes, yeah. exactly. You just have to do what you're doing. Yeah, exactly. Just do the audition and move on because so actors, I mean, you can't get your headshots right. Me, 
Get my headshot right. <laughs> uh, tomorrow, I have a good reel. Hire Steve Moon if you like to uh, film hey. reels. Thank you. Yes, I do reels. I I, I have done those. So um, okay, so let me ask you this. That was great advice, Steve. Like you guys have all of these projects lined up. What was the cheapest pro budgeted project that you've done, and what's been the biggest budgeted project that you've done? <laughs> You don't have to give me exact numbers, but kind of just be like, okay, this was like, you know, a hundred dollars and this was like, you know, two fifty thou. Uh let's see. Ginger, how much are we in the red on the ones that we do together? So there's some negative dollars out there, definitely. Uh, because when we did um our final hour, we didn't do a crowdfunding campaign. We did nothing. We just did it ourselves. So if I had to travel. Okay, um, I got to put my money in for gas or for a hotel, but we have a great lady that we uh, stay with. I won't say her name because people take advantage of that, but um, mm -hmm. she lets us stay uh, at, at her place, which is she's got a roommate. She's got plenty of rooms, so there's plenty of places to sleep. Um, in exchange, sometimes I'll cook for everybody, you know, because I can't afford to pay for your room, but I can't afford to feed you. So a lot of them were in the hole, which is no big deal, you know, because you're going to make your money back. It might be slow, but you're going to make your money back. Uh, the biggest one that I directed was around $168,000. Uh, and that was about four years ago. But to be honest, I'm not going back to that. And I never will go back to that because I can do, this is going to sound like bragging and I'm not because we can't take ourselves too seriously in this business because you know, we, we, I used to say we're playing make believe and pretend, but we're not because we are bringing honesty to a screen. But we're having fun, we're making art. We're the kids with the crayons and the spray paint and the splatter paint that our parents gave us to entertain ourselves. But now we're adults and we're doing it for a digital market that's out there. So you can take, I'd rather be in the red out of my own pocket and do something just as beautiful than to be in debt with, okay, well, now I got to deal with this and I got to make sure that I go to a sales agent that sells this for enough. Because I don't like the thought of, oh, well, we have to pay this person back. We have to pay this person back because on that side of the business, they're always on you. Well, Moon, where did this film go? Well, Moon, I want to get my investment back. And that takes the wind out of your sails. And if I can do something just as good as something with a five or six figure budget, you know, that's why I tell people all the time, just shoot something. Go out there. I don't care if it's your phone. Make it the best that you can be. Find the best talent that you have. Don't just hire somebody. Oh, my friend's an actress because she does uh, church theater. No, don't hire that person. Bring somebody in that has the same gift that you have and you just do what you do because um um not our final hour um across the sky i have to talk about this before we end across the sky is the aside from diamond it is the most beautifully broken movie that ginger and i have done because it's based on a true story long story short is in real life a girl lost her dad to like cancer or something like that. And she started sending helium balloons across the sky with little cards and happy birthday and stuff like that. You know, hoping it's just like, you know, 12 years old or whatever. And a true story in real life, this is what has happened. And then um, her dad and she were always going to go ride horses together, but they never got that opportunity because he died. Well, as God and faith would have it, a balloon in real life with her, a dress on it and everything landed a hundred miles away in Southern California on a horse farm. And this lady that got that balloon where it landed knew the address because the daughter put the address on there. And she came and knocked on the door and said, Hey, um, Mrs. Whatever her name was, it's Woodruff in our movie, but whatever. Um, here, here's, here's the balloon. Your daughter did one. And everybody was like, wow, this restores our faith. So long story short with that, is when we were getting ready to film this movie, we were casting for extras down in Fairhope, Alabama. And I guess somehow, Ginger, how did we meet the daughter? So, uh, the mom of, of a, a little girl had reached out to see if her daughter could be an extra. And then I don't remember how it happened, but she we offered her would she like to audition for the lead role. And it wasn't, she wasn't an actress. Um, but we let her audition, so she auditioned for the lead. And it turns out that she was 12 years old at the time, but four years ago when she was eight, she lost her dad to a tragedy. 
And it was a horrible tragedy. The, the dad bought her a goose because they lived on a farm and she always wanted a duck. He thought he bought her a duck, but he bought her a goose. So the goose flew away and landed on somebody else's property. And the lady that owned that property called and said, hey, um, ma'am, your husband needs to come out and get this goose before something happens to it. I know he bought it for his daughter. So the daughter says, hey, Je or whatever, not Jessica, um, can't even think of her real name. Now, anyway, she says, dad, will you go get my goose for me? As soon as he goes to that farm to pick up the goose, he opens his door and gets run over and killed. Real life happened to the girl that's not even an actress that played our lead character. And what's it called? Pain to Purpose. She used Pain to Purpose and made that entire movie that we shot on our phone, on my Canon. We had kids and the youth at the church. Everybody was involved in making this movie. And it was about the same story, you know, just when he changed it. And in the movie, her dad was murdered because he was taking her best friend home. And she felt like if she had not had her friend spend the night, you would have had to take her home. If you didn't go take her home, you would have get, had to get gas in mom's car. Mom, if you had gotten gas in your own car, dad would have to go to the gas station where the man that robbed the gas station shot and killed my dad. So she had to relate to all that guilt of her as a human being. Dad, go get my goose. Um, and now in the movie, hey, dad, take Tyler home. And she has to relive it all over again. And Ginger plays it. Was that? It was almost like serendipitous. Oh my gosh, God is divine. I mean, it was just right there, meant to be. Everything just lined up. Ginger plays the mom, and uh, to if Ginger wasn't here, I'd brag on her even more. But but to say just what an outstanding job she did as the mom, because I said earlier, I don't think Ginger, you were on, but to watch you play something different in each film that you're in, you are not the same person. You think and you to watch praises that. all day, Ginger. <laughs> it's just, she's got it she's got a gift and i want your audience to hear that because take your craft seriously because she has to play the mom that keeps it together but hey i lost somebody too sweetheart i lost somebody too so to watch them fight and to watch them battle and to watch how it all comes together at the end is just beautiful and i'm saying this to say this um ginger i'm gonna get this wrong but it's now showing in uganda at churches, and you you fill in the rest because I don't quite they're understand trying, all of that. Yeah, well, they're taking it and they're doing some kind of crusade. They're calling it a crusade with it, where they're showing it so that the people from nearby can come and watch the movie and maybe get some hope and healing for themselves if they've gone through anything uh, when they watch it. So they're expecting thousands of people to come out, and they've had big crowds like that for some of their showings of their other movies. So. It's it's awesome to me to be involved in things. I love entertainment period. I love all the fun of it. But when when I get to be a part of something that I know is going to help other people in some way, whether it's healing or hope or whatever, that makes a huge difference. And I, I'm excited that, that people oh, yeah. are going to get to that soon. And it'll be coming soon on Prime, but it's not on there yet. Yeah, yeah. It's already been picked up by Prime. We're just waiting on them to uh, release it. But something you had said earlier. Um, and I and I'll end with this part. Um, something you had said earlier. What's it like for you, like when you're on the set and watching something that you've written come to fruition, and everybody? It's about what Ginger just said. It's about that the crusade. It's about it's about what the finished product does to 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 people that are either watching it, they can identify with it, or that kid on set that is so nerdy that never gets the opportunity. And you say, here, will you hold this camera or will you hold this light? And, and you can tell that that is such an underdog that is never going to have that chance again. And Ginger has that heart of gold, too, that when we're on the set, we're going to take time out and say, well, hold on. We're going we're to take this little lost lad in, um, Kyle, and we're going to just make Kyle do what Kyle does best. And and because that's what it's all about. I love the art. Ginger's an artist. I love being an artist. Yes, watching everybody be a canvas and have this painting. To, and like I told Ginger the other day. The painting is already there. It's just inside here. But it's the Mona Lisa is already painted. We just have to wait until he paints it. So the end project is already there. Ginger is already chasing rain. Ginger is already Renee. Ginger is already all those people. You just haven't seen it yet. So, you know, before I wrap this up, I do want to ask you guys uh, one final question each, right? And it's to specifically, Steve, it's to the filmmakers. And for you, Ginger, it's to the actors. So... What would be the best advice that you would give to your to to that demographic if it, it, and give it in the essence of like you're speaking to yourself for the first time, right? That you're speaking to the younger you. 
So I go, you go first, Steve, and then Ginger followed up. But like for all the filmmakers out there, what's the best advice that you would give them in, in pursuit of this ever changing industry called Hollywood and filmmaking? And um, I can answer that quickly and easily. Do it. Just, just do it. You know, there's there's no right, there's no wrong. Yes, there are going to be mistakes. But just do it. Don't think you need the greatest camera. Again, we shot something on our phone that's in Uganda right now in front of 3,500 people, possibly. Just do the work. But if you want to call yourself a director or a filmmaker, whichever, you, I, I, I'm just me. But if you want to call yourself that and you want to, if you want bragging rights, because I don't have bragging No, Nobody has bragging rights. But if that's your goal, hey, I'm a filmmaker. Look what I just did. Make it look great. Again, go back to your lighting. Go back to your glass. Go back to your talent. Go back to your production design. I don't care if it is on your phone. And to anybody that wants to get in touch with me, we'll work that out later. But Ginger and I have talked about this. We're going to give somebody a scene, a team of filmmakers, actors, one scene. And we want each one of them that don't have anything to do with each other Send us what your interpretation of that scene is, and you will see a team of 10 people give 10 different versions of that. But I guarantee you the ones that are going to stand out are going to have the best production design, the best actors, um, the best everything. And that doesn't have to cost you money because those uh, picture frames, I know what they are, but I can say this. Go to the thrift store. Buy those picture frames. They're 50 cents each. Go do that. Don't just have a blank wall like the wall behind mine. So put everything that you have that doesn't have to cost you anything. Go to the thrift store, buy your wardrobe there. And the second advice, and then, then I'll hush after this, is I don't get paid for anything. You know, I get paid when Richie comes to town and he hires me to do art and props and stuff like that that I do for him. So don't be afraid as a filmmaker to to do free. Don't think you're going to go in there and I'm going to get rich. I'm going to sell this to Hollywood. Don't go in there. Just show them what you can do. Show them that you have the skills to make that scene that we're looking with Ginger right here lit properly. She's acting it properly. Do everything the right way. Because if you begin, go look at Mobland. Anybody in this audience can go make Mobland. I'm sorry, Travolta, if you hear this, but wow, I should, probably shouldn't say that because... Too late. Like, too late. But yeah, my, yeah, just go out and do it and make it look good. Just don't just run a camera. Think in the and don't hire a cameraman. Hire a director of photography. When I say hire, just get somebody that that knows how to be a DP, how, how to make a camera translate the story. So um, yeah, that's my advice is just do it. Just just, just do don't it. wait. Yeah, just do it. Don't, don't wait for the camera. Don't wait for the funding. Don't wait for everything. Just, just go out and show what you can do. Because I don't care if you have the Aria Alexa or if you have a cell phone. If you cannot light that room that Ginger's in properly, if you can't make her act like she's supposed to be, and you cast somebody because they're friend, your stuff's going to look like garbage. Whether you have the most expensive camera and glass or the least. So show them what you can do. What that, about you? So that, that, there's my advice. Yeah. So I will give the advice that I give to myself, which is don't let yourself start taking yourself too seriously um, because take your work extremely seriously. I work really hard. I work constantly. I'm always doing something that's involved with either film or modeling, but um, I don't let myself take me too seriously. Once I start doing that, I start losing the joy of it. I start getting discouraged, and then I want to quit. He can tell you how many times I think I'm going to quit doing this. Wait, wait, so, how many times have you actually quit? No, I'm quitting. No, I'm quitting. Yeah. I don't know how many filmmakers and actors I've met who are in that same boat all of the time. Just let yourself enjoy what you're doing. Um, it will be hard. It is hard. You're not always going to be picked, and most of the time you're not going to be picked. So know that up front. That's just how this industry works, and that's how it is. You're going up against hundreds or thousands of people for jobs. So just let yourself enjoy it. 
take what you do get and be thankful and don't forget to be grateful and don't let it be all about you because if it's if it's just always all about you you start to become miserable because you just think about why didn't i get this why didn't i get that why did they get that they must be better than i am let all that go let yourself enjoy what you do don't take yourself so seriously enjoy your life still have a life let it's, it's a craft so study the craft other side of the too, and good headshots, you know. Yeah, good headshots. No, that that's that's good advice. Uh, you know, especially the part I I, I can relate to you saying, "Hey, always wanting to quit," right? <laughs> it's, it, this is one of those spaces where if you're an actor out there, or a director, filmmaker, producer, writer, and you every six months you're like, "Man, I'm quitting. I'm done." Like that's just normal. We all go through that same feeling. Oh, every two weeks with Ginger, I'll get a message at night. Why am I even doing this? Why am I doing this? Yeah, you know, and then I'll go through the same thing. Like, yeah, you know, <laughs> we, we beat ourselves up. We are our worst enemies and because yeah. we're artists. Yeah. <laughs> well, I will say thank you, Ginger. Thank you, Steve. Thank you guys so much for being a part of the Hypertube podcast. It's been a pleasure. You guys have a beautiful day, and we're out. <laughs>